Welcome or welcome back to the International Day of Mathematics Celebration. Our purpose for gathering here today is to honor the magnificence and relevance of mathematics in our society. March 14th marks a global celebration of this remarkable field and its vital contributions to our world. As you may know, there is somehow no Nobel Prize in mathematics. However, the highest prize in maths is the Fields Medal, which was established in 1936 in the will of Canadian mathematician Charles Fields. The Fields Medal is awarded every four years during the International Congress of Mathematicians to researchers under the age of 40. It is considered the most prestigious award in this field, and it recognizes outstanding mathematical achievements for existing work and for the promise of future achievement. And today we are honored to have four distinguished mathematicians who have won the Fields Medal and who have agreed to speak at this event. They will share their experiences, insights and breakthroughs in their respective fields. We are extremely grateful to them for taking the time to share their knowledge and to inspire us all. This is a great opportunity for us to learn from some of the brightest minds in the world of mathematics. We hope you enjoy this session and leave it feeling inspired and excited about the possibilities that mathematics can offer us. But before we start, we have a very special greeting from the president of the International Mathematical Union for you, Hiraku Nakajima from Japan. My name is Hiraku Nakajima, president of the International Mathematical Union. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this fourth celebration of the International Day of Mathematics and the first celebration not overshadowed by the pandemic. March 14 was proclaimed the International Day of Mathematics by the General Assembly of UNESCO in November 2019. The theme for the International Day of Mathematics this year is Mathematics for Everyone. It means that mathematics is not only for the specialized scholars, such as mathematicians or scientists. Everyone can enjoy the beauty of mathematics, and everyone should use mathematics to improve their life. I hope that we could convey this message on the International Day of Mathematics to people in the world. Since the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development is presently taking place, it is important to recall that mathematics has an essential role to play in the sustainable development goal of the 2030 Agenda of the United Nations. The International Mathematical Union is proud to be associated with UNESCO to welcome you to this celebration that will highlight mathematics for everyone. So here's a puzzle for you. Originally posed by Kepler hundreds of years ago, how would you pack the most oranges into a box? Directly on top of each other or in the dimples of the layers below? This upcoming afternoon session will feature Marina Vyazovska, the second woman ever to receive a Fields Medal and a personal idol of mine. Marina specializes in number theory and has made notable contributions to the sphere packing problem, a well-known mathematical puzzle seeking the most efficient arrangement of identical spheres in a given space. Vyazovska's significant achievement was establishing the densest packings in, get this, eight and 24 dimensions. Wow. Yeah, uh, today she will share her personal journey to becoming a mathematician, highlighting the impact of passionate and devoted teachers. It promises to be a captivating and inspiring story. So my name is Marina Vazovska. I'm a professor of number theory here at the PFL and I study math mathematics and number theory in particular. I uh, was born and grew up in Kiev and I think I had a very happy childhood. I have two sisters, they grew up uh, together. Uh, I went to 
school to school in Kiev. So I think I realized that I like mathematics from the first grade. So in the first grade we learned how to uh, read, how to write and how to count. I realized that counting was my favorite. And uh, uh, since then I stood on this track and I'm moving <laughs> in this track. So maybe it's not a very interesting story. <laughs> and uh, when I, uh, like when I was in mid school, uh, I changed from a regular school to a school that specializes in physics and mathematics. And uh, I liked those subjects a lot. So, yeah, and when I finished high school, I decided that I will continue studying mathematics. So, as I know, I'm the only mathematician in my family. Uh, however, uh, my parents and my grandparents, they are chemists. Uh, so, the love to natural science already was in my family. But then, unfortunately, when I started studying chemistry at school, I realized that I don't like chemistry. So, yeah, it happens. Yes, yeah, so I think I was extremely lucky with uh, teachers actually starting from the first grade. Maybe it just happened that I got exactly the teachers that uh, I needed. And I think that uh, when it comes to learning, then really the, the personality of teacher is extremely uh, important. And I remember my first grade teacher, she was a, she was a very strict woman. And then my first math teacher, she was a super strict woman, but somehow they disagreed with me and this is what was I liked because I think deep inside they were actually very kind people who really cared a lot about their students. And I also met a lot of very special teachers in the Lyceum where I studied for physics and mathematics and these were people who were really excited about their subject and very excited about teaching and I think this, is, this was a very important period in my life when I really realized that uh, mathematics is very beautiful and it, it, you know, to, to learn it, it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of work but it is worth the effort. Uh, yeah, so I started studying in Ukraine and then I moved to Germany. And uh, yes, yeah, so I think for, for, for a student, for young scientist, the possibility to travel is important because uh, uh, not, there are very few places, there, maybe they, they exist, there are places in the world where you can study anything or almost any kind of mathematics, but they are few. May, uh, and usually it's important, it's important to go to another place just to get another experience, being exposed to other kinds of uh, research. Uh, and, uh, and also the academic culture in different countries, it might be a bit different. So in, in this sense, I think that travel does give a lot to young people. It helps to grow and uh, but maybe one of the exciting part of traveling is that it's possibility to meet, to meet people. And so after Germany, I came here to Switzerland to EPFL, and uh, yeah, so maybe he, here already came in a slightly in, as, as a professor in a different. Uh, uh, quality, but I am very happy that I, I have opportunity to work at this beautiful campus, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, also also it, it happens that I think right, right now EPFL is growing so fast, and uh, it is also an exciting opportunity to be a part of this, maybe to be involved in some decisions that will influence the the future of the of uh, this place, and I hope that. Yeah, so it will, as it's getting more and more exciting, so yeah. I'm looking forward to see what, what's waiting for us. So I teach here in the PFL, and uh, uh, yeah, so maybe it's for, for students to say whether I'm a good teacher or not, but I, I, I try to, and... Uh, yeah, also, somehow what, what I noticed that maybe with age when I was actually I, I started uh, 
teaching a different level when I was a student myself. But I think when I was, a, for example, when I was a student in Kiev University, I was organized, organized math circles in my own school. But I think that time I was actually much more interested in solving math problems myself. Uh, and I think as when I get older, I realize that it's really important to have interest also in your uh, students. And I, no, I, I don't think that I'm strict. I just, I think I am a bit, so sometimes I'm uh, really a bit excited about some topic and I, uh, okay, I might do things maybe a bit too complicated for students, uh, but, uh, yeah, so I also think that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like at some, at some level, so this uh, distinction between teachers and students, it of course exists in our society, but for mathematics, everybody is equal. So maybe the, the best experience which exists is when it's possible to forget that we are students and teachers and we can just discuss mathematics. And uh, yeah, whenever that works, it usually makes me very, very happy when when I actually can also learn something from my students. That's the most exciting moment. I hope that at least I'm doing something right here, so. Yeah, so I work in number theory and maybe the corner of number theory, which is closest to geometry and geometric optimization. So I, I try to answer the questions, what are the best possible geometric configurations of certain kind and what, Actually, usually the problems that interests me that when the solution to this problem also involves some uh, interesting number theoretic structure. Good examples of this is a packing problem when in low dimensions packing problems, the solutions to packing problem, they can be constructed from interesting algebraic or number theoretic constructions. And then you can also think about what is the reason for this and in, in general, uh, also, also I work in the theory of automorphic forms, uh, that uh, they are uh, functions with nice analytic properties and also a lot of symmetries. And so this becomes a very rich topic where different areas of mathematics come together, algebra, analysis, geometry, even topology for, so, so for, from time to time. And uh, I think also in spirit time, uh, problem solver, so I do like solving particular problems and to start building uh, theories not from the sake of the theory itself, but from a desire to solve a particular puzzle. So from time to time, uh, it, 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 I, it, yeah, mathematicians are lucky and then we can actually give a complete answer to the pro problem that interested us. So uh, this happened for me a few times and maybe one most of the problem I'm most known for is the sphere packing problem in dimensions 8 and 24. So my son is now 14 years old and uh, I'm not sure that he loves mathematics. I think he's more interested in programming. But uh, yeah, we discuss mathematics with him a lot because you know, he's at the age when, it's, when he really studies, uh, starts learning interesting things. And uh, yeah, so I hope that he will love mathematics at some point. Uh, but my daughter, she's too young, so, but okay, we already learned to count. Un, du, quatre, cinq. <laughs> so. Yes, probably my message to young girls would be the same as message to young boys. And my deep belief is that mathematics does not see the gender. So just for, for mathematics, we're all just mathematicians, uh, curious and intelligent beings trying to uncover its deep secrets. And uh, here, gender or nationality or race should not play uh, the role and uh, maybe one message for young people is not just not to be afraid of mathematics after all mathematics it's uh, rooted in uh, common sense and so if you have ability to think straight then you have ability to do mathematics um, and then yes and if you feel also if you think that mathematics is beautiful if you feel love for it then just uh, do it learn it and uh, I'm sure that this will give, bring some 
good result. Even if you don't become mathematician, I think it would be useful and exciting and interesting in any case. Sometimes, but uh, yeah, when, when that happens, I realize that maybe I need a, a bit of rest. <laughs> Our next speaker, James Maynard, has also fallen for the enchantments of number theory and has a special interest in prime numbers, that is, whole numbers that can't be expressed as the product of two smaller whole numbers. Despite their simplicity, prime numbers remain mysterious, and mathematicians have long tried to grasp their distribution and density among whole numbers. Maynard's groundbreaking work has demonstrated that there is an infinite number of pairs of prime numbers that differ by, at most, 246. At the same time, the gap could be um, between primes could be as large as desired. James approaches maths with a light-hearted attitude and encourages playful exploration as the best way to truly understand it. James Maynard is an engaging advocate for the joy of mathematics and believes that mathematics is accessible to all who have a passion for discovery. Hi everyone, I'm James Maynard and it's great to be with you here today, the International Day of Mathematics. The theme of this year's International Day of Mathematics is that mathematics is for everyone. I strongly agree, and my message to everyone out there is that you should always try and find the joy in mathematics. Mathematics is an absolutely beautiful and fascinating subject, but unfortunately sometimes people lose the fun and the playful nature of mathematics, which is really what makes me enjoy mathematics so much. It doesn't matter if you're just starting to learn mathematics for the first time in school, or if you're a professional research mathematician, I think it's absolutely vitally important to always have a playful attitude and to play around with the things that you're looking at. Follow your interests and find fun in whatever mathematical ideas it is that you're thinking about. This will not only make it a lot more enjoyable for you when you're going through this, but it's also absolutely vital, I think, to really understand what's going on, to play around with it, and to really get a feel for the objects that you're working with. I think this has really benefited me throughout my career. I remember when I was first learning about mathematics in school, I was always very interested in what I learned from the teachers, but rather than trying to accelerate through the curriculum when I had some spare time that I'd like to spend thinking about mathematics, instead I spent some time just playing around with the things that I'd learned. When I was learning multiplication tables, I would look at these multiplication tables and try and spot patterns in the numbers that turned up. And it turns out that actually lots of my current day research is also spent looking at mathematical objects, and trying to find patterns and understand what these patterns are caused by. But you can find fun in mathematics in anywhere you look, in everyday objects. For example, this is one of my son's toys that I really like. Um, sometimes when he's gone to bed, I like to play with it, but please don't tell him too much. And this is a simple toy designed for very young children, but there's lots of different mathematical ways you can look at it. You can think of these balls as being vertices, and then they essentially form the vertices of an icosahedron. Alternatively, you can think about the moving parts, and it's interesting and fun to play with them and see at what angle we need to tip things to make the ball start moving, which you can see is a simple application of uh, the interactions between gravity and friction. Also, the elastic 
forces the whole shape to return to this approximate icosahedron. And this can be thought of as an energy minimization process. Um, and lots of these uh, physical optimization processes that happen automatically in nature are still mathematically very mysterious and poorly understood. So even just the simple child's toy can have lots of different interpretations, different ways you can find it fun, and each of these end up having real mathematical implications as well. For me personally, I really enjoy just numbers and looking at how numbers interact with one another when you add them and when you multiply them. And it will, it's slightly surprising and embarrassing to admit that these basic operations of addition and multiplication we really don't understand very well. For example, one very important concept in mathematics that's very close to my own research areas and interests is that of prime numbers. So a whole number is called a prime number if it can't be written as two smaller whole numbers multiplied together. So for example, six is not a prime number since it can be written as two times three and both two and three are smaller numbers than six. On the other hand, five is a prime number because the only way to write five as two whole numbers multiplied together is one times five or five times one and these aren't both smaller than five. So five is a prime number. And it turns out that any whole number is uniquely built up of prime numbers multiplied together. So you can break any whole number down into a question about prime numbers, and therefore prime numbers encode lots of the complexities of multiplication. So although the prime numbers are therefore these fundamental building blocks in mathematics, they remain surprisingly poorly understood. One thing that the famous mathematician Gauss used to do when he was a 16 year old would be to look at tables of numbers, work out which ones are prime and try and look for patterns in these numbers. He made a very famous guess about how often prime numbers seem to occur and for different interpretations of Gauss's guess, uh, this is very closely related to the prime number theorem, which is one of the highlights of mathematics, or the Riemann hypothesis, which is often called the most famous problem in mathematics. I also enjoy looking at tables of numbers and just working out which ones are prime and trying to look for patterns in the primes. I used to enjoy doing this when I was a high school student, and my modern research, although it uses more theoretical tools, is also still trying to find patterns in these prime numbers. For example, one problem that has fascinated me basically throughout my mathematical career is about how close together prime numbers can come. If you start looking at prime numbers, you quite quickly see that two and three are the only prime numbers that can occur one after another. And this is because two is the only prime number which is a multiple of two, the only even prime number. This is why some people call two the oddest prime. But if that's all gaps of size one, you could also ask when do prime numbers come just two apart? So for example, three and five are two prime numbers which differ by exactly two. So are five and seven, 11 and 13, 17 and 19. And as you go on and look at bigger and bigger numbers, they become less frequent, but you still find quite a lot of these pairs of prime numbers that differ by exactly two. Mathematicians believe that there should be infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by exactly two. So no matter how far you go down the number line, you could always find lots and lots of these different primes, which come very, very close together. But this remains a very famous and unsolved problem, even though we've studied it for hundreds of years. It's known as the famous twin prime conjecture, and it's one problem that I find fascinating and I've thought about throughout my career. And so you see how often these fairly simple tasks that can be very fun of just 
looking at tables of numbers, trying to work out which ones are prime, trying to spot patterns, and having an inquisitive but interested mind can lead to these famous research problems like the Riemann hypothesis and the twin prime conjecture that are still open today. And it's this beauty of mathematics, these simple questions that lead to very deep ideas, which is really why I find prime numbers so mysterious and fascinating, but also in mathematics such a compelling subject. It doesn't matter what you're interested in or what level you're thinking about. I really encourage you to spend some time on your own just thinking about whatever mathematical ideas interest you and playing around with the objects. This is by far the best way I know to have to understand what's really going on, but also it's the best way I know to have fun and to enjoy what I'm doing. I was lucky that I came from a family that really encouraged me to explore my own interests, but I didn't come from a mathematical family at all. I was the odd one out in that sense that I had a mathematical and scientific interest. But I think it's stood me in really good stead throughout all my career, as well as made me enjoy everything an awful lot more, that I always had this playful approach to mathematics, and I was always trying to find the fun in whatever I did. We will now transition from number theory to physics, more specifically, phase transitions. Hugo Danieli Köppen studies these abrupt changes in the macroscopic behaviour of a system caused by small changes in parameters such as temperature or pressure. One example of this phenomenon is percolation. Imagine the following. You put coffee in a filter and pour water over it. If the coffee is coarsely ground, then the water passes freely through it. But there is a critical grind at which suddenly the water stops flowing through and stays in the filter. There you have it. This is a phase transition, like water turning into ice when temperature passes below zero. The study of critical grind fascinates mathematicians, including Hugo, since it led to discovering universal properties that apply to various phase transition phenomena. In this upcoming talk, titled Mathematical Attraction, this Fields medalist will delve into his research and undoubtedly provide an intriguing discussion. It will for sure be a very attractive talk. Bonjour à toutes et tous, c'est un bonheur d'être avec vous aujourd'hui pour la Journée Internationale des Mathématiques. Et je vais vous parler un petit peu de ce que je fais dans la vie. Euh, je suis passionné de mathématiques, mathématicien à l'Université de Genève et à l'IHES à Paris. Et donc, euh, j'aimerais euh, vous parler euh, de mon domaine de recherche. Je vais commencer par euh, une expérience, parce que parfois, les mathématiques, c'est aussi euh, concret. Et donc, c'est une expérience qui est reliée à ce qu'on appelle les transitions de phase, c'est-à-dire les changements brusques de comportement euh, dans la matière. Donc ici, ce qu'on fait, c'est qu'on chauffe un aimant et vous allez voir, il se passe quelque chose de très particulier à ce qu'on appelle la, la température de Curie. C'est que cet aimant, il va finalement arrêter d'être un aimant. Il va arrêter d'être attiré euh, par les métaux et là, dans le cas présent, par exemple, vous allez voir, il y a un petit peu de suspense, ça chauffe, ça chauffe et à une certaine température, quand l'aimant devient suffisamment chaud, il tombe tout simplement parce qu'il n'a plus d'attraction. Voilà. Donc un aimant arrête d'être un aimant à une certaine température. Et ce que j'essaye de faire, c'est de comprendre mathématiquement cette transition de phase, ce changement de comportement dans les aimants. Mathématiquement, l'outil que je vais utiliser euh, est un outil un peu, un peu particulier. J'aimerais vous l'introduire à travers un jeu. Ce jeu, c'est un jeu que tout le monde peut faire. Hein. Parfois, les mathématiques, c'est pour, euh, euh, c'est facile. Il n'y a pas besoin de, de beaucoup d'outils ou de choses comme ça. Donc là, ici, on a besoin d'une feuille et de deux crayons de couleur. Et on va jouer à la chose suivante. Donc, sur cette feuille, on va dessiner ce qu'on appelle un, un réseau en nid d'abeille, un, un plan de jeu comme, comme celui que je viens de, de mettre sur les slides. Et euh, maintenant, on va être deux joueurs, un bleu, un jaune. Et le bleu va colorier une case, puis le jaune va colorier une case, et en alternance comme ça, le bleu et le jaune vont jouer avec deux buts différents. Les règles du jeu, c'est que le bleu veut essayer de construire un chemin qui va de bas en haut. 
Tandis que le jaune, lui, il essaye au contraire de dessiner un chemin qui va de gauche à droite. Donc, il joue alternativement. Et le bleu essaye, là, par exemple, de construire un chemin qui va de haut en bas. On n'est pas obligé de, 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 de colorier des, des cases qui sont adjacentes. On peut colorier les cases qu'on veut. Là, le bleu, il essaye de dessiner un chemin qui va vers le bas. Le jaune essaie de le bloquer. Et puis, bon, voilà, je fais un petit peu un, un shortcut. Je, je, je coupe un petit peu le jeu. Et je regarde là, à la fin, par exemple, si tout le monde a joué. Là, ici, il se trouve que, par exemple, le bleu parvient à passer de haut en bas par le chemin qui est ici, qu'on qu peut voir qui part de, de l'hexagone d'en de, de, bas à, à droite. On voit qu'il y a un chemin bleu qui monte. Donc, le bleu a gagné. Voilà. Et le jaune a perdu. D'accord Vous pouvez jouer à ce jeu. Vous allez voir, c'est très intéressant. Il y, a, il y a un gros avantage pour le bleu, en fait, de commencer. C'est un vrai, véritable avantage. Et je vous encourage à essayer de vous poser la question euh, comment jouer le mieux à ça, etc. De jouer avec, euh, avec euh, vos copines et, et vos copains à essayer d'optimiser, finalement, euh, ce jeu. Voilà. Mais moi, je vais, je vais maintenant changer un petit peu les règles pour, pour aller vers l'objet mathématique que j'étudie, qui est l'objet de percolation. Et donc, la percolation, elle est faite comme suit. Donc, on va prendre le même, euh, le, le même plateau de jeu, mais on va prendre une pièce de monnaie. Et on va dire maintenant que pour chaque case, on va tirer cette pièce de monnaie. Et si c'est pile, on colorie en bleu. Si c'est face, on colorie en jaune. Donc, je fais pour la première, euh, pour la première case, j'ai tiré ma pièce de monnaie. C'était pile, donc c'est en bleu. Je prends une autre case. Je tire ma pièce de monnaie, c'est de nouveau pile, donc c'est en bleu, etc. Je prends une troisième case, c'est jaune cette fois parce que je suis tombé sur face, etc. Et je fais ça jusqu'à avoir colorié l'ensemble des cases de, euh, de mon plateau de jeu. Et ma question, c'est est-ce qu'il euh, y a un chemin bleu qui va de bas en haut ou est-ce qu'il y a un chemin jaune qui va de gauche à droite Maintenant, le tirage, le coloriage est aléatoire, mais j'essaye de me poser cette question. Donc, notez que pour l'instant, j'ai pris une pièce de monnaie, donc vous êtes d'accord qu'il y a la même probabilité qu'une case soit coloriée en jaune ou en bleu, tout simplement parce que la pièce de monnaie a autant de chances de tomber côté pile que côté face. Mais imaginez maintenant que je fasse quelque chose de différent. Donc, je prends un autre, euh, un autre plateau de jeu et je vais tirer des pièces de monnaie qui ne sont pas euh, ce qu'on appelle équitable, hein, dans le sens qu'elles vont tomber plutôt plus sur pile que sur face, ou au contraire, plutôt face que sur pile. Et ce que je vais faire là, c'est que je vais partir, je vais faire une simulation, c'est une vidéo due euh, au professeur Berglund, et cette vidéo, elle montre ce qui se passe quand on augmente les chances de tomber sur face, donc quand on augmente les chances que les hexagones soient coloriés en jaune. Donc, on commence avec une chance zéro, donc tout est bleu. J'ai juste colorié à gauche en jaune, mais tout est bleu. Et maintenant, j'augmente les chances. Donc, il y a de plus en plus d'hexagones jaunes. Et je regarde le jaune quand je pars de gauche jusqu'où il arrive à aller. Donc, voilà, on fait cette simulation. Vous voyez que plus il y a d'hexagones jaunes, plus le, bleu parvient, euh, plus le jaune parvient à aller loin. Et on voit que très rapidement... Hein, à un moment, c'est assez brusque, on se retrouve à parvenir à traverser de gauche à droite pour le jaune. D'accord Je vais juste vous faire une deuxième simulation, encore plus euh, violente, d'un certain point de vue. Hop, là. Alors, c'est raté. Alors, je refais, voilà. Une simulation encore plus euh, impressionnante parce que là, je vais partir d'un plateau de jeu encore plus grand, un immense plateau de jeu. Et je fais la même chose. J'augmente la probabilité que les hexagones, donc là, les hexagones, ils sont tellement petits que c'est même des points. J'augmente la probabilité que les hexagones euh, soit jaune. Et vous voyez, ce qui se passe, c'est qu'on a, on a un comportement très brusque, de, 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 un changement rapide de comportement où en variant un tout petit peu la probabilité que les hexagones soient jaunes, on passe d'un moment où le jaune n'arrive pas à aller très loin à un moment où le jaune arrive à aller à traverser, et ça a lieu très brusquement, très rapidement, en changeant ne serait-ce qu'un tout petit peu la euh, probabilité que les hexagones soient jaunes. Ça, c'est quelque chose qui est très similaire, si vous voulez, à ce qu'on voit dans les transitions de phase en général. Si je prends, par exemple, une transition de phase que vous connaissez bien, qui est le changement d'état de l'eau, si je passe, si je suis à 99,99% ,99 
degrés Celsius. Alors, j'ai de l'eau liquide. Juste quand je passe au-dessus de 100 degrés, ça devient de la vapeur. Exactement comme si je passe exactement en dessous de 0 degré, ça devient de la glace. Il y a un changement brusque de comportement. Ben là, dans ce modèle de percolation, il y a un changement brusque de comportement. On passe d'un cas où le jaune est très perdant, il n'arrive pas du tout à, 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 à aller vers la droite, à un cas où, au contraire, il arrive très bien à aller vers la droite. Alors, vous me direz, quel est le lien avec les aimants et avec ce titre « attraction mathématique » Ben, il se trouve, figurez-vous, que quand on essaie de comprendre les aimants, il y a en fait un lien direct avec la percolation. Je vais juste vous donner une petite idée. Bien sûr, ce ne sera pas une preuve complète, mais en fait, il faut que vous pensiez à un aimant comme étant une multitude de tout petits aimants. On appelle ça des dipôles en mathématiques. Donc, pensez à un aimant comme étant, imaginez que vous zoomez dans l'aimant et en fait, c'est comme plein de petits aimants qui sont les uns à côté des autres, et ces aimants, ils ont tendance à s'attirer ou se repousser les uns les autres. Alors, si vous pensez que ces aimants, ces tout petits aimants, ils sont à peu près posés régulièrement, vous obtenez un espèce de dessin comme ça, avec une grille, cette fois elle est carrée, ce n'est pas des hexagones, c'est des petits carrés, euh, une grille avec des euh, aimants qui pointent soit vers le nord, soit vers le sud, ou là, dans le cas présent, soit vers la droite, soit vers la gauche. Vous voyez, là, par exemple, on a un aimant bleu qui, euh, enfin, où le bleu euh, est plutôt à droite. Là, on a un aimant où le bleu est à gauche. Et donc, ce qu'on peut faire, c'est qu'on peut décider de colorier les cases où l'aimant pointe vers la droite en bleu et colorier les cases où l'aimant pointe vers la gauche en rouge. Et on obtient un coloriage de nouveau, un coloriage cette fois des cases carrées de mon, de mon réseau en bleu ou rouge. Je vous fais juste une simulation plus grosse. Voilà une simulation. Et en fait, là, exactement comme avant, on pouvait se poser la question à quelle distance le jaune parvient à aller en marchant sur les hexagones jaunes ou à quel, euh, quelle est la géométrie du jaune par rapport au bleu. Ben exactement pareil, dans le cas des aimants, on peut essayer de se poser la question de la géométrie de, de, des parties rouges et des parties bleues de ce dessin. Et en fait, il y a un lien très fort entre la géométrie qu'on vient de qu'on voit ici sur cette image et la géométrie euh, jaune bleu qu'on voit dans dans la percolation. En utilisant ce lien, on parvient finalement à expliquer des choses très intéressantes sur les aimants. Voilà, c'est c'était ce que je voulais vous dire aujourd'hui sur euh, la percolation et euh, l'attraction des aimants. J'espère que vous avez pu sentir pendant ces quelques minutes que parfois la, les mathématiques, c'est aussi des dessins, c'est aussi euh, euh, très concret. Euh, il ne faut pas forcément, moi, je n'ai pas une force euh, d'abstraction énorme, j'ai besoin de choses assez concrètes hein, qui me permettent de jouer avec mon imagination. Parce que pour comprendre maintenant, si vous voulez, ces images, qui, où vous pouviez voir qu'il y a des, des formes très compliquées. Là, quand on regarde, par exemple, ces formes bleues et rouges, on voit que les bords entre le bleu et le rouge forment des, des chemins très sinueux. On appelle ça des fractales, hein, des fractales aléatoires. Et il y a des choses très intéressantes à comprendre. Il faut développer de nouvelles idées mathématiques pour comprendre ces choses-là et finalement essayer de comprendre l'expérience même où on chauffe notre aimant, l'élément perd son aimantation à une certaine température. Voilà, j'espère que ça vous a plu et euh, j'espère que j'aurai l'occasion de rencontrer certains d'entre vous. En tout cas, je trouve que les mathématiques sont une, une matière formidable pour tout le monde, à la fois pour les hommes, les femmes, de tout horizon, de tout pays. Et donc, profitons de cette journée pour euh, honorer euh, toutes les personnes qui aiment les mathématiques et euh, j'espère que vous aurez beaucoup de plaisir à faire vous-même des mathématiques. Bonne fin de journée et euh, belle semaine des mathématiques à vous. As we come to the end of this amazing session, we are thrilled to have Jun Ha as our final speaker. Ha, a Princeton professor originally from South Korea, had initially believed that he was not skilled at mathematics due to poor performance on elementary school tests. Like, can you believe it? Oh my God. Like, he eventually became disenchanted with the monotonous routine of studying and even left 
high school to pursue writing poetry. Writing poetry. You heard me right. Poetry. <laughs> However, Hu's interest in research level maths was sparked again after taking an algebraic geometry course. He now focuses on combinatorics and has been able to prove, prove several famous conjectures drawing on connections between geometric objects and discrete objects. Hu sees maths and poetry as intertwined forms of expression, as both offer a way to articulate complex ideas that cannot be expressed through conventional means. Like Albert Einstein once said, pure mathematics is, in its way, the poetry of logical ideas. 네, 안녕하세요. 수학자 허준이입니다. 2023년 세계 수학의 날을 맞이해서 오늘은 경계와 관계라는 주제로 이야기를 해보려고 해요. 여러분 어렸을 적에 사전을 찾아보면서 놀았던 기억이 있으신가요? 요즘은 사전보다는 위키피디아에 링크에 링크에 링크를 누르서 따라가면서 시간을 보내는 일이 더 흔한 것 같은데 근데 저는 어렸을 때 사전을 찾아보면서 정의에 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 정의를 따라가면서 노는 과정이 재미있더라고요. 예컨대 오늘 발표하려고 하는 주제에 사용된 두 개의 단어 경계와 관계를 가지고 이 놀이를 해보자면 은 경계를 사전에서 찾아보자면 사물이 어떠한 기준에 의하여 분간되는 한계라고 써져 있고 관계는 둘 이상의 사람, 사물, 현상 따위가 서로 관련을 맺거나 관련이 있음 또는 그런 관련이라고 써져 있어요. 그러면 이제 이 중에서 하나의 단어를 또 골라서 저는 예컨대 관계라는 단어를 설명하는 데 사용된 관련이라는 단어를 정해볼게요. 그 단어를 또 사전에서 찾아보는 거예요. 그럼 관련은 무엇이 다른 어떤 것과 서로 연결되어 얽혀있음 이라고 되어 있네요. 그럼 그 중에서 또 하나의 단어를 아무거나 골라서 예컨대 연결이라는 단어를 골라서 연결이 어떤 뜻인지 사전에서 찾아보면 어떤 대상을 다른 대상과 서로 이어서 맺음 이렇게 써져 있고 또 대상이 무엇인지 찾아보면 의식, 감각, 행동 등의 작용이 향하는 객관의 사물 이렇게 써져 있고 계속 계속 계속해서 나아갈 수 있어요 그래서 여러분이 보시면 은 아시겠지만 어떤 대상을 혹은 단어를 정의하는 데 사용된 다른 단어가 원래의 단어보다 꼭더 쉬운 단어는 아니에요. 그리고 조금 더 크게 생각해 보자면 우리가 가지고 있는 단어의 숫자가 엄청나게 많기는 하지만 그 숫자가 유한하기 때문에 이러한 작업을 반복해서 하다 보면 은그 사전이 모든 단어를 다 설명한다는 가정하에 반드시 그 전에 내가 정의하려고 했던 단어를 사용해야만 새로운 단어를 정의할 수 있는 상황이 오게 돼요. 그래서 이걸 생각해 보면은 꼭 논리학에서 말하는 순환 논리, 가장 대표적인 논리의 오류로 꼽히는 모든 것이 순환 논리고 어떠한 것도 정의할 수 없는 것이 아닌가라고 생각이 들기 쉬운데 우리의 언어라는 것을 일상생활의 경험에 비추어서 생각을 해 보면은 꼭 모든 것이 순환 논리처럼 보인다고 할지라도 우리가 언어를 사용해서 제법 멋진 일들을 해낼 수 있고 우리가 서로 소통하는 데에도 꽤나 유용하게 사용을 하잖아요 그래서 이게 어떻게 된 일인가 잘 생각을 해보다가 어느 날 들린 장난감 가게에서 이렇게 생긴 장난감을 찾았어요 이게 스퀴쉬라는 장난감인데 네트전에 미국에서는 꽤 인기였어요. 저희 둘째가 요즘 잘 가지고 놀고 있는데 이 장난감을 보고 있으면 은 12개의 꼭지점이 있고 그 두, 12개의 꼭지점이 느슨한 고무줄로 연결되어 있고 딱딱한 막대들이 두 개의 꼭지점을 연결해 주고 있어요. 그런데 이거 서로가 서로 딱딱한 부분들이 전혀 만나지 않고 떨어져 있으면서도 우리가 이 장난감을 비틀고 하더라도 굉장히 원래의 모양으로 금방 돌아와서 항상 이 정이십면체라는 독특한 모양 혹은 의미를 만들어내는 것을 볼 수가 있어요. 그래서 우리의 
언어가 의미를 가지게 되는 과정도 이러한 구조와 비슷하지 않나 라는 생각이 들어요 그래서 우리가 본질적으로 의미라는 것을 구성하는 방법이 무엇인지를 생각해 보면 관계 짓기가 굉장히 중요한 요소라는 것을 알 수가 있어요 어쩌면 은 이것이 우리가 의미를 구성하는 유일한 방식일 수도 있을 것 같아요 그러면 이제 이런 거를 수학의 관점에서 한번 생각을 해볼게요 수학은 마치 이것과 조금 다른 구조를 가지고 있는 것처럼 생각이 되죠 왜냐하면 은 우리가 늘 배우듯이 수학의 모든 명제들은 우리가 공리라고 하는 정의하지 않은 개념들이 가져야 할 성질들을 선언하는 몇 개의 단순한 논리적 명제로부터 모든 것을 구성해낼 수 있다고 생각을 하잖아요 그러니까 서로가 서로를 지탱하는 구조라기보다는 큰 나무가 있어서 여러 개의 수백 개의 수천 개의 나뭇잎 사기들이 있지만 그 결국 모든 것들을 따라가다 보면 은 하나의 뿌리, 공리라고 부르는 그 뿌리에서 나오는 것처럼 생각돼서 조금 다른 느낌을 받을 수 있어요 그렇지만 수학도 사실은 우리가 언어를 사용하는 것과 오히려 조금 더 비슷한 면이 있다는 것을 여러분들께 확신시켜 드리는 시도를 제가 한번 해볼게요 제가 배울 때는 이제 공통수학이라는 과정에서 이제 명제라는 단원이 있었는데 거기에서 보면은 역, 이, 대우 라는 명제 사이의 관계들을 배워요 이제 P이면 Q이다 대우가 예컨대 Q가 아니면 P가 아니다 라는 명제인데 여기에서 가장 중요한 사실 중에 하나는 뭐냐면 명제와 그 대우는 동치라는 거예요 여기서 동치는 뭐냐면 수학과 논리학에서 두 문장이 완전히 서로 같다는 것을 의미하는 거예요 한 문장이 참이면 다른 문장도 참이고 한 문장이 거짓이면 다른 문장도 거짓이 된다는 뜻이에요 그러면 이런 관점에서 우리가 소위 증명이라고 부르는 것이 어떠한 과정인지를 생각해 보면 참으로 이미 알고 있는 명제들 여러 개에서 추론이라는 과정을 거쳐서 새로 참으로 알게 된 명제들을 도출해내고 이러한 과정들을 여러 번 반복해 가면서 우리가 원래 참인지 알고 싶었던 명제까지 길을 찾아가는 과정이라고 할수 있을 거예요 그러면 조금 공상과학 같은 얘기지만 가능한 모든 명제들로 구성된 공간을 한번 생각해 봐요 그리고 이 공간이 어떻게 생겼을지 한번 상상을 해 보는 거예요 그런데 이 공간의 특징 중에 하나가 누가 바라보느냐에 따라서 굉장히 다르게 보일 거라는 점이 있어요 만약에 모든 이제 도출의 과정이 너무너무 분명하고 자명한 전지전능한 자에게는 아마 이 공간이 이렇게 보일 거예요 이 공간엔 두 개의 점밖에 없어요 참인 명제들이 있고 거짓인 명제들이 있어요 모든 참인 명제는 서로 동치이고 모든 거짓인 명제는 서로 당연한 동치이기 때문에 두 개의 점밖에 없고 재미있는 기하학적인 구조는 전혀 없어요 이 공간이 그렇지만 전지전능한 자가 아니라 우리가 만약에 이 공간을 바라본다면 이렇게 재미있는 구조가 아마 보일 거예요 여기서 여러분들이 보시는 점 하나하나가 다 명제라고 생각하시고 그 명제와 명제를 잇는 선들이 우리가 소위 증명이나 추론이라고 부르는 과정일 거예요 이 공간이 우리에게 다른 식으로 보이는 이유는 뭐냐 하면 우리에게 있어서 어떤 명제는 다른 명제보다 더 증명하기 쉽고 어떤 명제는 다른 명제보다 더 증명하기 어렵고 그러니까 예컨대 이 공간의 여러 점들 사이에 마치 어떤 점들은 서로 가까이 있고 어떤 점들은 서로 더 멀리 떨어져 있는 소위 말하자면 기하학적인 구조를 가지고 있는 것처럼 느껴진다는 말이에요 그 조금 전에 보신 명제 공간의 그림이 제가 좋아하는 이제 우리 우주의 거대 구조와 크게 닮아 있다는 생각을 종종 하는데요 여기서 여러분이 보시는 점 하나하나가 이제 은하인 거죠 그러니까 이것을 명제들의 공간이라고 상상을 해보면은 예컨대 사색 정리 모든 평면 그래프는 네 가지 색으로 칠할 수 있다 그러니까 어디 한 점이 있고 
또 페르마의 마지막 정리같이 다른 어떤 명제들도 따로 다른 점이 있고 그럴 거예요. 그런데 이 수많은 가능한 명제들, 특히 이 수많은 가능한 명제들 중 참인 것들 중에 페르마의 마지막 정리나 사색 정리가 왜 특별히 흥미롭다고 생각하냐 하면 은이 명제들이 이 공간의 복잡한 공간의 구조를 드러내주기 때문이에요. 무슨 말인가 하면 은 예컨대 리만 가설 같은 굉장히 어려운 문제를 생각해보죠. 어떤 사람들은 리만 가설이 참인지 거짓인지 알고 싶어하는 이유가 만약에 뭐 온라인 뱅킹 시스템의 보안 시스템을 무너뜨릴 수 있거나 방어할 수 있기 때문에 뭐 이런 식의 이야기를 하기도 하는데 저는 그것보다는 그 리만 가설 같은 명제들이 이 공간의 구조를 더잘 드러내 보여주기 때문이라고 생각을 해요. 왜냐하면 은 예컨대 사색 정리나 페르마의 마지막 정리 같이 무엇인지 말하기 문제가 무엇인지 설명하기는 쉬운데 그것을 증명해내기는 쉬운 명제들은 이 공간, 예컨대 마치 사색정리나 페르마의 마지막 정리 같은 점들이 우리가 서 있는 곳에서 굉장히 가까운 곳에 있는 것처럼 보이는데 사실은 가기 힘든, 왜냐하면 우리가 서 있는 곳과 그 명제가 있는 곳 사이에 뭔가 거대한 장애물이 있어서 우리를 못 가게 막는 기하학적인 구조를 잘 드러내 보여주기 때문에 중요하다고 생각을 하는 거예요. 이게 아이들이 끝없이 반복해서 왜? 라고 물어보는 이유하고도 비슷하다고 생각해요. 왜냐하면 아이들은 사실의 나열에 관심이 있다기보다는 이 관계의 지도를 탐색하는 데더 흥미가 있기 때문이에요. 왜냐하면 우리에게 의미를 주는 건 관계이기 때문에 자 그러면 은 경계에 대해서 잠깐 생각을 해볼게요. 이게 사물이 어떠한 기준에 의하여 분간되는 한계라고 하는데 잘 생각해보면 이게 관계 짓기에 필수 조건이에요. 왜냐하면 은 너와 나 사이에 관계가 있으려면 너와 나 사이에 경계가 있어야 되잖아요. 왜냐하면 너하고 나가 있어야 되기 때문에 이거를 수학에서 가장 유명한 경계 중에 하나를 예를 들어서 생각을 해볼게요. 우리가 흔히 이산이라고 부르는 개념이 있고 연속이라고 부르는 개념이 있잖아요. 그런데 조합과 대수는 이산일 거고 해석과 기하는 연속일 거예요. 우리 대부분의 사람들이 혹은 많은 문화권에서 이 이산과 연속을 너무나 직관적으로 경계지어서 예컨대 가산명사, 이산에 해당되겠죠? 혹은 불가산명사 같은 것들을 영어권에서는 완전히 문법적으로 독립적으로 취급하기도 해요. 물리학에서는 여기 알버트 아인슈타인 박사가 얘기한 것처럼 이제 입자와 파동 사이의 이중성에 대해서도 흔히 생각을 하죠. 이것도 아주 굉장히 흥미로운 이상과 연속 사이의 경계 중에 하나죠. 그런데 때로는 경계를 만드는 것보다 경계를 넘어가는 것이 중요하기도 해요. 예컨대 어떤 복잡한 모양의 넓이를 구하고 싶을 때그 모양을 잘게 같은 모양의 더 작은 모양 피스로 잘라서 그것들이 몇 개인지 세는 것이 아주 좋은 방법 중에 하나죠. 왜냐하면 세는 것은 쉬우니까 그리고 이런 소위 구분구적법이라고 하는 것이 나중에 적분의 발명에 굉장히 중요한 역할을 하게 되죠. 이것이 연속적인 문제를 이산적인 방법으로 다루는 거예요. 반대로 이산에서 연속으로 넘어가기도 하는데 예컨대 여러분한테 젤리빈을 엄청나게 많이 준 다음에 몇 개인지 세어보라고 하면 은 물론 하나씩 셀 수도 있지만 너무 어려울 거예요. 그렇지만 누구에게라도 이런 문제를 준다면 그 사람 아마 경계를 넘어갈 거예요. 이제 젤리빈이 이산적인 대상이라고 생각하는 게 아니라 물같이 연속적인 대상이라고 가정을 한 다음에 예컨대 어디선가 컵을 가져와서 컵에 하나 꾹꾹 눌러 닿은 다음에 한 컵에 젤리빈이 몇 개나 들어가는지 세보고 그러한 컵이 몇 개나 있는지 두 과정으로 나눠서 생각하는 거죠. 말하자면 젤리빈의 개수를 세는 대신에 젤리빈의 부피를 구하는 거죠. 그래서 우리가 봤듯이 우리가 의미를 만들어내는 과정에서는 관계 짓기라는 것이 가장 중요한데 관계를 지으려면 그 전에 분명한 경계가 있어야 돼요. 
그렇지만 또 반대로 경계라는 것을 일단 한번 지어 놓으면 은 때때로 우리가 그 경계를 필요한 경우에는 자연스럽게 넘어갈 줄 아는 방법을 배우는 게그 다음 단계의 직관을 가지는데 굉장히 중요해요. 그리고 경계를 만들고 허물고 관계를 만들고 허물고 이러한 순환 과정이 우리가 무언가를 진짜로 이해한다고 하는 끝이 존재하지 않는 과정을 우리가 걸어나가는 길이라고 생각을 해요. 수학에서도 그렇지만 다른 많은 분야에서도 비슷한 일일 거라고 생각해요. 이제 경계와 관계라는 것이 하나의 동전의 다른 면이고 마찬가지로 편견과 직관이라는 것도 하나의 동전의 다른 면일 거라고 생각을 해요. 여러분이 여러분 다른 분야에서 혹은 저 같은 경우에는 이제 수학에서 이러한 이 양면성 혹은 쌍대성을 찾는 것이 즐거운 과정이라는 것을 잘 느꼈으면 좋겠습니다. 오늘은 여기까지 할게요. 감사합니다. What a day! As the International Day of Mathematics Celebration comes to a close, unfortunately, we would like to take a moment to express our heartfelt thanks to everyone who has contributed to this remarkable event. The talks and presentations that we have witnessed today were truly amazing and they have inspired us all to see mathematics in a new light. This event has showcased the diversity and richness of mathematical research and its many applications in our world. We hope that these talks have given you a glimpse of the exciting opportunities that mathematics offers and have encouraged you to explore this fascinating field further. We would like to extend our gratitude to the distinguished speakers, the organizing committee, the sponsors, and all those who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this event a success. Most importantly, we thank all of you, the participants, for your enthusiasm, engagement, and curiosity. We encourage you to continue your mathematical journey and spread the word about the beauty and importance of mathematics to those around you. Mathematics truly is for everyone. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you at the next International Day of Mathematics celebration. Goodbye and see you soon.